Well, thank you for, for the presentation, Sibili, and thank you to all of you for being, uh, for attending this panel and taking interest in, in Blake and nationalism. I think these are fascinating topics, and uh, thank you, Jason and Sibili, for organizing as well. Uh, I am I am enjoying myself enormously. Uh, so um, I'm going to go into into the topic of my presentation. So. Um, the presence of William Blake in Spanish literature has been studied by scholars such as Cristina Flores. However, no wide-ranging studies have been conducted about the presence of Blake in Galician culture and literature. Galicia, today an autonomous region of Spain, has its own language and distinct culture and literature, which were key in the development of a Galician national identity. This process includes literature uh, originally written in Galician, but also interactions with other national literatures, such as Irish, Portuguese, or Spanish. This paper will explore the 20th century Galician reception of Blake through the works of Placido Castro, Álvaro Cunqueiro, and Luis Seoane. I'm, I'm trying to, yeah, there we go. Um, Martínez Quintanar uh, mentions the presence of Blake, among other British romantic poets, in Galician author Placido Castro, who translated some of Blake's Songs of Innocence for a Galician newspaper throughout the 60s and 70s. Other scholars only briefly mention Blake in their papers about the poet and engraver Luis Seoane, on account of his illustrations for Pablo Neruda's translation of Visions of the Daughters of Albion and the Mental Traveler into Spanish, published by Seoane himself uh, through his house Botella al Mar in 1947. Álvaro Cunqueiro published articles in local papers, including poems translated into Galician that are now compiled in different anthologies of his translation and journalistic work. Through the analysis of their works, I will determine the extent of the presence of British Romanticism and Blake in Galician culture and demonstrate the importance of cultural transnational exchanges in process of, processes of constitution of national identities and literatures. Galicia went through a period of splendor in the Middle Ages from the 12th to the 15th centuries and then fell into a 300 years decline until the 19th century, when groups of poets and artists took on the mission to revitalize Galician culture using, among other strategies, its association with a mythical Celtic past. Successive literary movements in the 20th century, such as the Xeración Nos, Us Generation, continued drawing on legendary connections with Ireland to support Galician culture. The Galician authors and artists I will explore are heirs of these movements, whose efforts were truncated with the start of the Spanish Civil War and the subsequent dictatorship. While some authors and artists go in exile, many others continue their efforts despite the risk of political reprisal from the Francoist regime. It is in this climate that some Galician writers show interest on, in Blake, understanding his legacy from the framework established by their predecessors in the 19th century resurgimento, meaning renaissance. Galicia, according to them, has a common Celtic ancestry with other Atlantic regions, and therefore Irish and British inspiration may revitalize Galician literature and arts. Now we'll examine evidence of this presence in the works of Seoane, Castro and Cunqueiro, and critically interpret the meaning of Blake for these Galician writers and artists. In Galician authors, we find a turn to an idea of Blake that emphasizes ideas of nation in order to strengthen their own national identity themes. Madariaga's description of Blake's poetry resembles those of the 19th century Galician resurgimento poet Rosalia de Castro. Rosalia has been often characterized for a sentimental nationalist romanticism that returns to the simplicity of the language of the humble people of rural, rural Galicia. Although Rosalia's life and works have many other aspects, this is her popular image, one of pure and innocent individualism, of the folk musicality of Rosalia's verse and the theme of nature that Madariaga emphasized in Blake. Eugenio de Andrade, a contemporary Portuguese poet and admirer of Rosalia dedicated her a short poem in which Blake is mentioned. And I translated it this way. A few verses for Rosalia. This mist fluctuates, as in Blake's poem, over the wet earth, land that prolongs mine, where poverty works, every plot, every word, and melancholy gnaws and gnaws 
the bones, the stone, land of Rosalia. This might point to the specific horizon of expectations Galician authors might have had when reading Blake. Placido Castro published uh, English and French poetry transferred into Galician in 1946. His 1949 essay, Comparative Study of the Lyrical Sadness of Cristina Rossetti and Rosalia de Castro, analyzes Rossetti's naively childlike lyrical poems in her sing-song and mentions how critics compare them to Blake's unearthly rhythms and ethereal songs and popular traditional songs. He mentions Blake, among other poets, as exponents of a Celtic spirit in his words that he connects to these qualities. He tried to associate the feeling of Galician saudade with authors like Blake, Shelley and Coleridge. According to Martínez Quintanar, the choice of Blake and other British romantics was due to their vindications of imagination and nature, of freedom from religion, mechanicist philosophy and scientific discourse. This attests to Castro's dubious categorization of Blake under the same label applied to Shelley and Coleridge and the traits it implies. Castro's essay, Vida y Poesia, Life and Poetry, 1965, comments on Songs of Innocence and of Experience as the works that grant Blake, uh, quote, poetic immortality, despite his confused, as he says, prophecies. Castro's judgment comes from the horizon of expectations of Galician folklore, a romantic sentimentality based on Rosalia, and his reliance on the traditional idea of British romanticism. The musical spontaneity of the songs appeal more to Castro's horizontal concept of Atlantic or Celtic pastoral than the prophetic books. Castro's translations from English contain uh, Asenflower or Shirasol, Infant Joy, Ledithia Infantil, and The Lamb O Año. Blake's sophisticated simplicity in Infant Joy is translated by Castro to familiar and expressive Galician turns of phrase, such as Pretty Joy as Ledithia Bonitera, Similar sentimental idiosyncrasies can be found in Oaño, where he translates, gave you voice of sweet delight with the affectionate and familiar Galician diminutive Iña, Deuce Sabostan Tenriña, even when it doesn't appear in the original. Seoane shared with Blake the conception of the integration of poetry and visual art, an attitude that he also admired in Morris, Ruskin, and the Sheffield Utopian socialists. Exiled in Buenos Aires, Seoane founded the publishing house Botella al Mar, where he published in 1947 Neruda's translations of Blake. Seoane's illustrations for the translations of Visions of the Daughters of Albion and The Mental Traveler are a modernist avant-garde reworking of Blake's Uthun. In the first extant letter where he mentions Blake, he speaks about the Spanish poet and artist Rafael Alberti, whom he compares to Blake and he extols both Alberti and Blake for the hard work required by engraving. A trade, he said, that demands patience and effort, what is known as material labor, struggle with a material, metal, wood, or whatever it is. His friend Nelly Perazzo commends infant joy or the divine image for their union of word and image in response to Seoane's interest in Morris's group and the Sheffield Utopians for their integrative approach. After that, Seoane speaks of Blake again to the writer Domingo García Sabel in a letter where he thanks him for his comments on his new woodcuts album, Insectario. In it, he describes his quasi-pantheistic worldview. He confesses to feel an intimate link to nature and to human beings in whom nature expresses itself. Conversely, human traits are revealed to him in natural beings and objects. This animism he associates to a pagan Galicia where the Celtic belief in metempsychosis would have unconsciously prevailed. And I quote, we innocent Galicians, potential Celtic sages, knew something was to be contained in the stones, the earth and the waters we have always believed in, end of quote. The same belief he perceives in Blake and his creation of the ghost of a flea. Blake, he says, Celtic poet, when he wanted to hurt a neighbor, he drew him and wrote underneath the ghost of a flea. He did not think of any sort of machine, big or minute, but of that apparently insignificant creepy crawly. The last letter where Seoane mentions Blake makes reference to the common fascination of many artists like Kokoschka, Klee or Mondrian for the occult speculations and Eastern thought, in other words, for mystery in general. Not only then he adopts the notion 
that Blake was a pantheistic Celtic romantic, but also that he was fascinated with mystery, a word that was rather abhorrent to the real Blake and the occult. While Blake did read and appreciate Swedenborg, Paracelsus, Jakob Böhme, or the Bhagavad Gita, and Shakespeare far superior as early as in the marriage. Rather than doctrine and system, he thought ultimate wonder was to be found in art and poetry. He thus proceeds, the Pre-Raphaelist Blake, finding esoteric ideas throughout the Bible, have in some way something to do with them. In Seoane, we discover a construct of a Celtic Blake in tune with the defense of Galicia's an Atlantic region in Spain, with an aura of Celtic myth, origins and connections, a legend originated during the Resurdimento. Álvaro Cunqueiro is well known in Galicia for his magical realism and his neo-medieval poetry, inspired in Galician Portuguese cantigas. He was also a follower of the Celtic Arthurian myth, which he used in works like his novel Merlin and Company, which is translated into English. His efforts to define Galician culture and literature with reference to other Atlantic peoples led him to Ireland, Scotland, Wales and England, as well as Brittany. He was also a prolific translator, publishing numerous poems in the paper Faro de Vigo. He also wrote two chronicles of Blake's aesthetics, William Blake, Dos Cantos de Inocencia, Os Cantos de Experiencia, and William Blake, Noceo en la Terra. He translated into Galician and combined I Let Me Down Upon a Bank, Are Not the Joys of Morning Sweeter, and Mocon, Mocon, Voltaire Rousseau, entitling the result Dos Poemas de Amor e un Demofa, Two Love Poems and a Satire. Uh, he preserves formal traits such as structure, alliteration, and repetition. Excuse me, what's the previous one? Um, where lovely sleeping becomes a carondo amor adormecido. Weeping, weeping, salocos es salocos. But changes the setting with tank rushes turned into as roseiras, the rose trees. The roses generate more contrast with the thistles and thorns, nettles and brambles in Galician, which are more. Nat lo local natural references, who are also not beguiled in Galician, but punished, castigaron. This evokes a more forceful and violent imposition of religious repression, which consciously or not fits the context of Galicia under the Francoist regime. While age and sickness silent rob the vineyards in the night in English, in Galician they go to Vendimar, harvest the grapes, which is the word for the traditional activity, rather than one for a furtive action, and the same verb used for the young ones who, plucks, who pluck fruits before the light. Only in this example we can see how local traditions and political context have influenced the reading of Blake. In conclusion, the readings of Blake in Galicia evidence a great interest in the lyrical, musical and bardic side of the Blake from the songs. The reception of Blake in, uh, by Galician authors provides us with insights on both the reception of Blake in a minoritized culture and the construction of Galician identity from Romanticism and beyond as a global process that bridges Galicia with many cultures around the world, especially with the British Isles and Ireland. The ambiguously patriotic but transcultural bardic Blake read in Galicia could run the risk of acquiring the jingoism it has been associated to in Britain occasionally, such as in some appropriations of Jerusalem, but nonetheless offers resistance to cultural homogenization. Thank you very much. And uh, here are uh, my works cited. And um, I would also encourage you to get in touch with me as uh, more activities and, and, and related events can be as, can come in the future associated especially with with Seoane uh, as, as I am in touch with um, the Seoane Foundation head the head of the Seoane Foundation a wonderful museum and center in Galicia so if anybody's interested in, in organizing something perhaps we can get in touch thank you